Well, manhood in general, I think, but fatherhood in particular is, is under attack in our nation. There is just so much contradictory, ri ridiculous stuff swirling around us. While, while some people call for fathers to rise up and take a stand, we seem to be surrounded by quicksand and by landmines. There's just nowhere to put our feet. We hear the call to rise, but we seem to, we seem to get knocked down every time we try. And we try to take a stand, but no one seems to agree on what a father should be. So sometimes it feels like the expectations on us dads are just myths. They're myths. They're, they're caricatures. They don't really exist in reality. We're not even square pegs in a round hole. It feels more like we're mere mortals in a Marvel universe of superheroes. That we're, we're being held to standards that are impossible to meet. And then we deal with the criticism and the unmet expectation of others on the outside. And then the self-doubt and the disappointment within ourselves. So men, listen, I've got good news for you today. This is not beat up dad day. You're welcome. It's not beat up dad day. This is a word of encouragement day. This is an oasis in the desert day. It's a rock in the quicksand day. It's a timeless truth in the midst of an ever-changing expectation. This is a spiritual reality that flies in the face of fiction and fantasy. This is a reset button for stressed out, beaten down dads. So today's message is rainbow unicorn dads. Rainbow unicorn dads. Today we're going to be busting the myths of fatherhood. Busting the myths of fatherhood. And Zay, if you can help me out, man, I hear way too much of me. Y'all are like, I agree. Amen. Way too much of John. So if you can help me somewhere, that'd be great. So before we get into it, let me recognize uh, just a couple of things. First of all, there are a ton of ways to be a dad. A ton of ways to be a dad to somebody. Fatherhood is not just a biological function. It's a function of the will. Amen? It's a commitment of the soul. So for all you dads, biological or step or foster or adoptive or spiritual or however it is, thank you for what you do for our sons and daughters. So this message is for you. And secondly, since these are spiritual principles, pretty much all of them apply to male and female, dad and non-dad alike. So ladies, uh, non-fathers, don't tune, don't tune out now. It's not just for dad. All right, so here we go. The first myth that I'd like to bust is this, the myth of the perfect dad. The myth of the perfect dad. So the Belk ads came out. Y'all get those in your mailbox too? The Belk ads came out for Father's Day uh, a couple weeks ago, and they just make me want to throw up. It's just, have y'all looked at these things? As a matter of fact, I hated them so much that I brought them today to share with you. Isn't that what dads do? Oh, this is terrible. Taste this. So that's that's what we're that's what we're going to do. So uh, let's let's throw this. Uh, let's throw, oh, there's casual dad, casual dad, and his little dock ciders. Isn't that cute? And then we've got uh, what's next? We've got act, active dad carrying his golf clubs and his perfectly white shoes. Um, we have outdoorsy dad. That, that's not even a thing. There's not even a word outdoorsy. But there's outdoorsy dad. Is he carrying a surfboard? Like what is he doing exactly? And then there's, then there's my personal favorite, stylish dad. Stylish dad. Now, can we just agree as we look at these things that most of the dads we know don't look anything like this? Right? So like look around the room. <laughs> there, there are no belt dads here. Can, can, we just, can we just agree, though, that almost all the images of fatherhood look just like that? Like, I don't see myself in those ads. I don't see myself, I don't see most of my friends in those pictures. Where are the dads that are a little bit too old for, to have kids that young? Or the dads that are a little too young to have kids that old? Like, where are the bald dads? Where are the bald dads? And I, I'm not talking about like sexy bald. I'm talking about like real bald dudes that just ran out of hair. Where are the images of the dad that's like 30 pounds overweight? 
that peaked in high school, <laughs> you know? Where, where's that guy? What about the dads that just ain't that good looking? I mean, not like hard-boiled ugly, just like a solid C plus, B minus. <laughs> where's that dad? And then you look at the, at the ads for Home Depot and Tractor Supply. It's the same guys. They just put them in flannel shirts and blue jeans and send them to the... It's ridiculous. And you, then you watch TV, you see the same dads, and they're having tea parties with their little girls, and they're playing sports with their sons and winning. And they, and they, they take their wives on romantic weekends every weekend, and they're dancing, and, and they're the envy of the room, and they're climbing in the corporate ladder far beyond the, their, their peers. And it's just, it's impossible. It's ridiculous. It's an impossible standard to uphold. So let me tell you something today, guys. There is no perfect dad. There's no perfect dad. Maybe on Facebook, where you can control everything you see in here. Maybe in Hollywood, not in reality. Perfect dad is a rainbow unicorn. And in case you're struggling with that, it's a myth. There is no rainbow unicorn either. Okay? So, w real dads make mistakes. Real dads lose their tempers sometimes. Real dads are ornery sometimes. We make bad decisions sometimes. Now, this is not a confirmation of a life of mistakes. So, if you, know, if you got a problem, fix it. But neither is this condemnation. It's simply a recognition that life is tough and men are flawed. All of them. All of them. Every man. So we're not good at everything. We're not, we're not always going to be the top of the heap. We're not always going to be the best looking or the best dressed or the most qualified or the most athletic or the most intelligent or even the most present. And that's okay. It's okay. David, I think you will agree with me that David, King David in the Bible, was a pretty impressive man. Warrior, poet, king, musician. As a matter of fact, David was such a great dude that he was probably featured in the Belk ad for Jerusalem in the day. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. But, but guess what? He wasn't perfect. He wasn't perfect. Cheated on his wife. Had a man murdered. Dis he, he, he misappropriated the power of his office. He disobeyed God from time to time. Got filled with pride sometimes. And he had some jacked up kids. I mean, y'all think y'all's kids are bad. David has some terrible, truly terrible kids. But he was, he was also quick to repent. He was quick to admit he was wrong. He wasn't above humbling himself before God and before others. He wrote many of the Psalms. And in many of those cases, David wrote, he wrote those Psalms confessing his sins, telling God how, how, how horrible he feels about his failures and his flaws, and asking God for forgiveness. And then I want you to look at a couple of other scriptures regarding David and look at how he handled things. David said to Nathan, I've sinned. I have sinned against the Lord. Listen, he didn't say it was her fault. It was his fault. I, I, if this hadn't happened, I wouldn't have done that. He just said, listen, I blew it. I sinned against the Lord. And, David said, and Nathan said, yeah, you have, but the Lord's forgiven you and you're not going to die for this sin. And then verse, chapter 24 in verse 10 after David had taken the census, his conscience began to bother him. And he said to the Lord, I've sinned greatly by taking this census. Please forgive my guilt, Lord, for doing this foolish thing. And, and then in verse 24 and 25, as the, because the wages of sin is death. And so as the, as the nation began to pay for David's mistakes and David's sin, the, the Lord replied to, uh, to Arana, who had offered to give David everything he needed to make this sacrifice. Here's the, here's the wood, here's the, here's the bull, here's the altar, here's the lamb, here's everything. And David said, no, I insist on buying it. I'm not going to present offerings to the Lord my God that have cost me nothing. And so David paid him 50 pieces of silver for the threshing floor and the oxen. David built an altar there to the Lord and sacrificed burnt offerings on it and peace offerings. And the Lord answered his prayer for the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. David manned up. David knew because it was his sin that caused Israel to suffer, it would be his sacrifice to cause the suffering to end. And so he didn't just say, yes, this was my fault. I'm sorry. He did something about it. So how do you combat 
being a perfect dad? How do you combat this perfect dad myth? How, how do you push back against it? The same way David did. You, you balance it out with humility and with integrity. Listen, guys, don't try, to, don't try to hide your flaws and don't try to make excuses for them either. Own them. Own them. If you're bad at something, just say, I'm bad at this. Ask another dad for help. Ask another person for help. For example, if you can't play baseball, like don't try to teach baseball to your children. Ask somebody who does know how to do that. And, and, and then don't coach them from the sidelines either. Any coaches in the house want to say amen? Thank you, Lord, for that. Play with them in the yard. Have fun with them. Encourage them. Teach them to listen to their coaches. It's a great way to model humility. It's a great way to model respect for authority. And it gives them permission not to be awesome at everything. Is that like a surprise? Like our children are not going to be awesome at everything. You realize that. Yeah, there we have to give them permission to try some things and go, yeah, that's okay. I'm not really great at that. It's okay that you're not great at that. Nobody's great at everything. All right? So the more we perpetuate this myth of perfection, the more we burden our children with it on another generation. Your kids need to see you fail sometimes. You say, but I don't want to give them permission to fail. They're going to fail with or without your permission. So what you have to do is model for them the honesty to know your strengths and weaknesses and the wisdom to know your limits. And if you've sinned, if you've made a huge mistake, then we model, or even a small one, then what we have to do is model repentance before God. We have to model sincerely apologizing for those that, that you've hurt, for owning the repercussions, and then doing the hard, humbling work of making amends. I want to show you this in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6. 1 Peter 5 and 6, he says, So humble yourselves under the, the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. We want to be, all dads want to be honored. We want to be respected. We want to, and we don't just want it given to us. We want to, we want to earn it. We want to earn the right to be honored and respected. But the path to doing that is not by demanding it, not by requiring it, but by humbling yourself before God. When you humble yourself before God, he exalts you. He lifts you up. He honors you. But, but it's from a lifetime of humbling yourself. Wouldn't we all be thrilled if our children turned out that way, if our children humbled themselves before the mighty hand of God? Would that be okay with you if your kids did that? They learn that by watching you. They learn it by watching you. If we'll teach it, then they'll have the chance to learn it. And then here's another area of perfection that, we, that dads struggle with. I had a conversation with someone, a serious Conversation. This dad was really torn up about it a, a few months ago. When did we start equating uh, good parenting with omnipresence, like being everywhere at all times? When did we decide that good fathers have to be at every event, at every school party, at every practice, at everything? When did that become a thing? There is nothing wrong with telling a kid... I'm not going to make it today because I have to work. It's okay. Can I set you, I, I know the, out, the oxygen just got sucked out of the room, but can I, can I set you free from some of that, dads and moms too? Now, if you're a workaholic and you're just hiding at work, or if you've got marriage problems and you're hiding at work so you don't have to deal with that, like get both of those things fixed, that's not healthy. Or if it's a really big deal, of course, you try to get off work so you can be there for your kid for a big deal. But don't hang yourself up because you can't be at every t-ball practice. It'll be okay. Sometimes dads have to work, and that's good. You talk to the kid about it. Don't like just ghost them, just don't show up. But teach them it's important and f to fulfill your obligations, and it's essential in being a good man or a good woman? Who, how are they going to learn the importance of, of, of honoring your commitments if they see you running in, in every direction every time? Sometimes it's okay if you have to work. Teach them 
Y'all ready for this? Teach them that they are not the center of the universe. Because as, if y'all need my mailing address, it's on the website. As soon as they step into the real world, they're going to figure out pretty quickly and pretty painfully that the world does not revolve around them. So listen, their cupcake is going to take just, taste just as good at their school party if you ain't there to watch them eat it. And if your kids are like my kids, they probably ignore you when you go to the party anyway. So quit stressing. Quit stressing yourself about it. Stop holding yourself hostage to expectations that have nothing to do with being a good parent. You're welcome. Now, the church is almost as bad as the world at putting ridiculous, impossible standards on people. I didn't say God. I said the church. The church. If you hang around the church very long, then you, you'll, you'll get the feeling that if you, if the only way for your children to grow up with a relationship with God is like you've got to preach a message at the end of every family dinner. You have to preach a message like Billy Graham. That, that you have to like build an altar out back and sacrifice sheep on it or something. That you, you have to be this spiritual giant with these, these creative and incredible devotions. And when we talk about stuff like that, we're setting dads up for failure because it intimidates us because we're like, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how to do that. And so what, what happens most of the times we wind up not doing anything and we just avoid the topic of spirituality uh, altogether. Let me take you off the hook, dads. Just do what Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I mean, seriously, be strong in your relationship with the Lord. Bring your kids to church. Don't just send them. Bring them to church. Worship in front of them. They need to see you with your hands up. They need to see you passionate about things that matter. They, they need to see you living what you say you believe. So don't put on a face at church that has nothing, no bearing in reality at home. You need to be who you say you are. They need to see you show up to work, show up to serve, show up to help. They need to see you. Listen, seeing you be devoted speaks way louder than any devotion that you'll ever come up with. So because they're not, going to, they're not going to listen to what you say, they're going to become who you are. So take yourself off the hook of the, of the perfect dad myth. There is no perfect dad. Show them instead a dad that's humble, a dad that's honest, and a dad that's sincere in his relationship with the Lord. Here's a second myth. The, uh, the, the omniscient dad the all-knowing dad. This is, what I, this is what I call, in my old age, this is what I call the father knows best dad. And if you're too young to remember that show from the 60s, then just listen to the title again, Father Knows Best. In the mythology of this, when one of the children gets themselves in trouble, they come and they humbly ask dad for advice. And you, because you are a father, are omniscient. You know all things. You are revered for your sage wisdom and for your deep insight. Or when your children are secretly doing something that they're not supposed to do, or they're concerned about something that they're not sharing with you, then the omniscient dad immediately knows exactly what's going on, exactly the right thing to say to snap them out of it, or to fix, him for, fix it for them, or, or to tell them how to fix it for themselves, and to make their lives perfect again. Can I let y'all in on a little secret? I mean, this is, this is big stuff. It's probably going to blow your mind. It's this is like magician secrets revealed right here. Here's the truth. Dads don't always know. They don't always have the answers. Dads don't always know what to do. Shocking, I know. The omniscient dad is a, is a unicorn, rainbow unicorn. Our children are often in trouble, but rarely ask advice. They, and when they do ask advice, they rarely listen to that advice. And if they do listen to that advice, they rarely put it into practice. And if they actually do what you told them to do, it rarely works out the way we thought it would in the first place. All right? And, and don't our wives do, it, do this to us as well? Have you ever been driving somewhere and somebody cut you off or somebody do something crazy? And she says, what in the world were they thinking? 
What were they thinking cutting us off like that? What makes that person drive that way? I don't know. I, I don't even know them. I've never met. How would I know what, what they were thinking? Or, or when the kids do something enthusiastically stupid. Did your kids, your kids ever do enthusiastically stupid stuff? And your wife says, why in the world did they do that? I mean, what came over him that he would, it would cause him to be so reckless? What went through the mind of your child to make them act that way? Are we really supposed to respond to these questions without sarcasm? <laughs> really? I mean, and then we do, and then the fight starts, right? At the end of the day, the reality is we're just human. We don't know. We don't have all the answers. Sometimes we don't even understand all the questions. And it's not because we're dumb. It's because life's complicated. It's too complicated for anybody to be expected to have all the answers. So dads, take yourself off the hook if you don't feel like you're qualified to be an expert life coach, whatever a life coach is. So how do we, what do we do? How do we push back against this myth of fatherhood? James chapter 1 and verse 5 says this, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he'll give it to you. And, and here's my favorite part. He won't rebuke you for asking. God is not surprised that you don't know. And he's not mad at you for not knowing. He just wants you to come to him. If you'll come to him, he will give you the wisdom that you need. So here's how this plays out in reality. What would happen if the next time one of your kids came to you for advice and you honestly just didn't know, you didn't see a clear path forward, you didn't know what to do? What would happen if you said, listen, baby, I'll tell you what, I really am not sure what to do either. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray about it. And we're going to ask God to show us what to do. And then, just like right there on the spot, it doesn't have to be a fire-calling prayer, just a simple, humble re request to God asking for direction and wisdom. You think God would answer that kind of prayer? And do you think you would be modeling something for your kids that would teach them how to do that when they become adults, when they have children, modeling something they're going to need eventually themselves? I think that'd be a game changer in most of our homes. And what about those times when you know something's going on with your kid? You know something's bothering them. You can't quite put your finger on it. What would happen if, if, if when you talk to them and they won't open up, that you say, listen, I love you too much. I love you too much to leave this alone because this is clearly important to you. It's clearly bothering you. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask God to show me exactly what's going on with you so that I'll know how to pray for you, and so I'll know how to intervene if you're in trouble. And then you just say, listen, the Holy Spirit gives gift, the gifts of wisdom, gifts of, of knowledge, gifts of prophecy, and I'm going to ask him to do that for me right now. You say, Pastor, do you believe that God give, would answer that kind of prayer? Do you, do you believe he speaks to people like that? Do you think he would give me spiritual gifts to be used for my family? Because I thought spiritual gifts were only used for like you know, spiritual stuff. Listen to me. There is nothing more spiritual than your role as a dad. Nothing. And there's nothing more important to the kingdom, more important to healthy churches than strong, healthy families. So yes, I believe God does and has and will answer those prayers. And when he does, it won't take very many times of the Lord showing you what's up before your kids will just start spilling it the first time you ask because they know God's going to tell you anyway, right? So do fathers know everything? Absolutely not. But godly fathers know the heavenly father and he knows best. And that's all we need. That's all we need. Here's the last myth that I, that I want to tell you about. And this is the useless dad. Useless dad. He's, he's one of the characters on almost every children's programming. All the kids' shows. It's, it's, he's all over Nickelodeon, Disney, and in all the movies with little children. It's useless dad. You know useless dad. Always distracted. 
pays no attention to the kids when they talk to him, doesn't help around the house, isn't engaged, only focuses on his hobbies and his entertainment, doesn't really make, help make informed parental decisions as a parent, just checked out and useless, right? You see him on all the kids' programs. Basically, he's a fool. He's the fool that everybody laughs at. But that's not the reality for most of the dads, the vast majority of the dads that I know. That guy is a rainbow unicorn. They invented him. They made him up. The dads I know love their families desperately with all their hearts. And they are out there every day busting their tails for them. If, this, if there's a disconnect, if something's weird, it's, it's simply from being overwhelmed with the responsibilities of fatherhood. Or it's the discouragement of a society that downplays the role of fathers and criticizes their every move. We live, we live in a culture that's adopted this hyper, hyper feminist attitude where you hear this all the time. Well, if I want a man, I'll get me a man. But, you know, I don't need one. I can take care of myself. And I, I, I understand how strong and intelligent and independent and capable women are. And the reality is they've had to be because too many men have walked out on their responsibilities. But listen, let's don't paint with too broad a brush here. Just because there are good kids that have been raised by great single moms, let's don't decide that dads are useless. They're clearly not useless. God's plan for parenting is a mom and a dad who are married to each other and are fully committed to God first, then to each other, and then to their children. And the research backs that up. The research backs it up. Uh, about 15 years ago, you know, the pr there's, there's this premise that we've sort of understood about ministry in the church, and, and we've assumed that, oh, and I've heard people say it over and over again, if you can get the kids in the church, you'll get the family. Y'all heard that at church? You get the kids, you'll get the family. The research is in about 15 years ago, and that's simply not the case. If you get the kids, the family comes about 4% of the time. Four. And I suspect it's even less now because in our busy society, parents are happy to get a couple of hours of free child care on Sundays. So they send them little babies on to church. So we said, well, if we get the moms, we'll get the family. That's not what the research says. The research says when mom comes, the family comes with her about 17% of the time. But when the fathers start coming to church, the rest of the family attended 93% of the time. 93. And some, and some more recent research from, from some Swiss researchers showed that the influence of dad on the spiritual development and nurturing of their children is astoundingly important. Like almost impossible to pass down a spiritual legacy without the presence of a dad who is also committed to that spiritual legacy. Dads, you are not useless. You are vital Vital to the spiritual formation of your children. Vital to their walk with Christ. They need to see you living your faith. They need to see you loving Christ. Now let me show you a few, a few roles in the Bible that, that the Word calls dads to. And there's, there's a ton of them, but let me just highlight about three of them. Hebrews chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews is talking about the spiritual discipline that we all have to go through sometimes. And he says, as you, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. And then here's a hypothetical question. Ha, ha, who, who, have heard, who ever heard of a child who's not disciplined by its father? Who ever heard of a child not disciplined by its father? In our modern day, this is not a hypothetical. This is not a question that has an, an implied answer all of us could raise our hand and say, oh, Lord, I know dozens of children who are not disciplined by their fathers. Hundreds of children who are not disciplined by their fathers. Fathers are vital to the discipline of our children. I'll tell you what, as a former teacher and administrator, there'd be a whole lot less problems in school if we, if we quit telling dads they're useless and quit fussing at them for trying to discipline their kids. There'd be a whole lot less crimes committed There'd be a whole lot less people in prison. And, and much of it can be traced back to dads 
buying into this myth of uselessness, just walking away from their responsibilities, or if they're in the home, just checking out. Dads are not useless. Let me show you in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. And we, this is two halves of a verse, and sometimes we, we clamp onto the first half and we ignore the second half. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. And in pulpits all across the country today, there, there are preachers that are beating up dads about the, us making our kids mad in the way we, and we do aggravate our kids too much sometimes. But let's don't forget the back half of this verse. Rather, fathers, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. The, this verse talks about discipline as well, but it also says instruction. Dads, listen, don't punish your kids. Do not punish your kids. Discipline your kids. Discipline them. Discipline involves teaching. It's actually the same word. When you go back to the original language, to, to, to the Greek, discipline and disciple are the same word. Discipline involves teaching. It's not just about what they did wrong and the consequences of that, but how they can do it right. It's love and limits. It's, it's grace and truth, just like our Heavenly Father does for us. And then here's one more. In, in Psalm 103, verse 13, it says this, The Lord is a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Fathers don't just lay down the law. We also show kindness. We show compassion. We show tenderness. Real men are not harsh taskmasters. And they aren't, they aren't weak little wusses either. Right? Right? Are y'all okay? I just said that, totally said that on Sunday morning. But you know those are the extremes, right? And, and the reality is we have to be, we have to be in the middle, walking, walking the straight and narrow path. A real man is strong enough to do whatever it takes to meet the needs of his kids. That's what dads do. That's what real dads do. So sometimes when they come to you with a little bit of blood on their knee, sometimes it's, I'll rub some dirt on that and quit whining. Right? Dads need to say that every once in a while, don't they? Ain't nobody saying amen this morning. Dads need to say that every once in a while. My daddy say, that'll quit hurting. That'll feel better when it quits hurting. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. But sometimes we need to say, come on up here in my lap and let me look at it. Come on up here and let me hold you. Sometimes it's discipline and sometimes it's compassion. Sometimes dad is the prophet, and sometimes he's priest, and sometimes he's provider. Sometimes he's warrior, and sometimes he's lover. Sometimes he's a diplomat, and sometimes he's brave heart. But at no time is a father useless. No time is a father useless. So gentlemen, if you've been, if you've been, sitting, if you've been sitting back trying to figure out where to put your feet, Buying into the myth that society told you. Today has to be the day that you hear the truth. You may not be perfect, but you're not useless. You may not know everything, but there are some things that you know that your kids don't know. There are some things that you've seen your kids hadn't seen. There are some places that you've been your kids haven't been. And it's time for us as dads to step up, to shake off the lies that we've been told, to just let those things fall in the dust and get back into the leadership game or be encouraged if we're in it. Get back in that parenting game. Get in the influencing game because our children are not going to raise themselves. And there'll never be a time where there won't be a role for you to play in your child's life. That it won't be the same role. It evolves over time. It changes. Parenting, parenting kindergartners and parenting adult children are not the same thing. It's not the same set of skills. But there's always a role for dads to play in the lives of their families. So whether they belong to you or not, whether they are your biological children or not, it's, our society needs fathers. We need fathers. So if you've got influence over children in any capacity, let's step up today and be a father. Would you stand with me?